Good afternoon and welcome to SBI Health and Safety webinars. Thanks to all of you for being with us this afternoon. Um, we'll discuss a subject that affects a lot of workers and a lot of organizations in many different industries, um, managing unconfined spaces. My name is Valerie. I'm the Marketing Advisor for SBI. And I'm pleased to have with me uh, Mr. Harry Van Lundkamp, Consultant and Trainer at SBI Health and Safety and Sean Donovan, uh, Business Development Manager at MSA uh, Safety Canada. So the purpose of this webinar is to enable you to validate, compare, and develop your knowledge on confined space management, and that will allow you to build, improve, and even audit your confined space uh, program. This is not a training, but we hope you will find it very informative um, and interesting. Here's an overview of what will be discussed during the webinar. We will go over the norms and regulations before discussing the key elements and the conditions of success for an efficient management of confined spaces. And uh, we will go also over the tools that are available uh, to you uh, to make your, your life easier managing your confined space. Very quickly, I have to go uh, through technical stuff before leaving the floor to Harry and Sean. Um, this webinar will last for an hour. We will try to keep a little bit of time at the end for the questions, but we welcome all your questions throughout the webinar. So please, please don't hesitate. Ask questions at any time um, by using the Q&A box on your screen. Um, we will try to make this webinar as interactive as possible, even though we're behind the screen. Uh, we we want to hear from you, so just don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, for your information, you also have some documents available to you that you can download uh, at any time during the webinar. So you have um, an e-book from MSA talking about confined space and the equipment, and you also have some key steps uh, to implement a successful um, management uh, program that you can download. So that being said, um, building a program is a lot of work and that can be very complicated. Um, Harry, can you tell us a little bit what motivates people doing so? Well, thank you, Valerie. Uh, first, why are we talking about confined spaces? Because they have hazards and if there are hazards, well, there are regulations. My questions for the participants would be the following. Are you doing this because it's following the arrival of a new person? Do we have a new occupational health and safety director or coordinator? Is it following an accident or an incident? Have you had a recent visit from an inspector or are you following up on an internal corporate audit? Or where are you in the management of health and safety right now? This is a new priority. For others, it's one of the big risks to manage. For others, it's part of your cardinal rules. Hi, it's Sean. My question for the participants would be, what is your motivation to start, modify, and improve the management of confined spaces? It's important to know your motivating factor before you begin. Setting up a confined space management program is essential for good risk management. There are many strategies and actions, but you need to find the ones that are most relevant to your reality. Often we see organizations copy programs that do not reflect their reality. It is important also to understand that each approach involves challenges to manage. Avoid obstacles in your path. In 2017, confined spaces are no longer managed globally, but more specifically. Above all, it is important to ask yourself some questions. The regulations emphasize the obligations and the responsibilities of the organizations regarding confined space. It is important to perform a proper analysis of the situation. Do the practices respect regulations? How is your in-house risk management? Are we well versed in the regulations and subtleties surrounding the confined spaces? How can the CSA standard support us in our approach? Is the current management of your confined spaces appropriate? If we had to go to court together to defend your current management, would you win? This is a question I often ask my clients. Often we really know the answer as soon as we ask the question. I mean, Ari, these are very good questions, but concretely for um, a safety leader, 
How can we answer these questions? Well, today it's important to first take a snapshot of the situation. Tools do exist, such as a gap analysis or a gap measurement. This is a widely used tool by organizations that have established corporate standards. And it is very simple. The principle is based on the comparison between the current situation and the situation projected or desired by the organization. It allows us to identify the adjustments and the tasks to be carried out in order to eliminate or reduce this gap. We have developed our own tools at SPI for first to study the documentation in place. We compare the elements in place versus the regulations and the standards, both CSA and corporate. Second, to diagnose current practices, we evaluate a confined space entry and look at all the aspects from beginning to end, and we often have surprises. Third, by assessing perceptions. As the person responsible, the person that is in charge of the, of the confined space entry, um, have you done a self-evaluation? What is um, the attitude of the person responsible? The quality of current practices. What are your current practices that are employed uh, at this time? and your ability to play your role in confined space management. So what is your role? What have you established? Are your responsibilities? And are you efficient at, uh, at uh, applying your role? Having a good picture of the situation will allow you to make better decisions in all aspects of the management. But we can also add to this the choice of appropriate equipment that we'll talk about later. Let's take the time here to ask you a question. So you're going to see to your screen um, a question we want to ask you. Do you have a confined space program in place uh, right now in your organization? So you can select the answer. No, it's not a priority for now. We've been thinking about it, but we do not know where to start. We're working on it. Our program has been implemented and we're starting to follow up. What do you mean by confined space program? I'm going to give you a little bit of time uh, to, to, to give us your answer. And, and this is really just for us to have a good understanding on, on where you position yourself in, in terms of confined space management. Are you expecting any answers, Harry? Well, I find that this is a very common concern. I mean, I have performed many hazard analysis for various companies, and they often Stand, their stance often falls into one of these answers, and this helps us guide us into where we're going to apply the, uh, the, the bulk of our efforts into updating or to creating their confined space program. Okay, so let's look at the um, results together. That's pretty good. I mean, 82% of the people answer that their program has been implemented and they're starting to follow up. So I'm pretty surprised of that, and so this is very positive. This is an excellent result. Um, well, we'll go to a second question, um, maybe a little bit different. Uh, we're going to ask you, so we'll see, you will see uh, the second question in your screen. There you go. What are your main concerns in relation to confined space management? So there's really no good answer here. Uh, it really depends on, on the organization and the person who will manage the uh, confined space. So you can answer managing risk to equipment and systems, the different training sessions for the stakeholders, the procedures and documents required, the legal requirements, or the managing on contractors. Maybe you have more than one, but let's try to have the main, the most important concern for you. We'll wait a little bit. We still have people that are currently answering the questions. Okay, so let's see the results together. Okay, so we have 17% uh, that their concern is about the training session, 25% uh, the, the procedure and document require, and 58% that are, uh, th their concern is about the legal requirements. So it's 58%. Majority of the people answer is about the legal requirements. Are you surprised by that answer? Um. A little bit, but I find that uh, the legal requirements are easily available on the internet. When you can go into the provincial regulations quite easily and find out what are the re legal requirements, 
quite often what I find is that people do not interpret properly the legal requirements. And so they, they have some sort of a hesitation as to how it best applies to their situation. Interesting. So we'll now go to a little survey that we did um, within the company, I think, Harry. Um, Um, we have performed a survey of uh, numerous organizations some time ago, and I want to share some of the facts and the observations. Okay. We found that 50% of, org of organizations do not even have a confined space management program. Often the management is limited to a document, such as an entry permit, or it has become a complex or heavy set of documents, such as the program and or procedures, which are not clear for the stakeholders. So very often, they are seldom used or even applied. Another observation, among the organizations that, that do not have one, 90% did not know that it was necessary to have one. And among the organizations that did have one, the program is not up to date and or incomplete. In 75% of the cases, it is not or is poorly communicated to the stakeholders and in 75 percent of the cases, this is the uh, situation. When we talk about the various stakeholders, what I'm talking about also are the entrants, attendants, supervisors, managers, and what we now see often are champions. We talked earlier about the regulatory aspect. Each province has regulations. The goal here in the webinar is not to interpret every single article that would take hours or even days. What is important to remember is that each article can have repercussions in efficient management. We must add to this also the CSA Z1006 standard that we'll talk about uh, a little later as well and, the corporate, and your own corporate standards. My question to the audience is, uh, is Bill C21 the motivating element for initiating a management program? Is that what's really driving a lot of this? Well, we often hear concerns in our training sessions about, uh, or our customer interventions about the Bill C-21, and I find it is becoming more and more of a motivation element. This is a federal law that came into effect in 2004 and covers criminal negligence concerning health and safety infractions, infractions that could result even in serious injury or death. We can see the same sort of things uh, with uh, the federal regulations, uh, companies that are, are uh, governed by uh, in the federal jurisdiction. An important point to make here is that for some companies or organizations, organizations both regulations may apply. We see that especially for uh, numerous subcontractors. For these, under, these are usually uh, governed by provincial jurisdictions but when they work for a client under federal jurisdiction, they must comply with both regulations, so the most severe of the two regulations. Here are some observations on the regulations. It's important to understand that they are neither uh, black nor white. They leave room for interpretation. It may be easy for some to interpret the regulations. However, once you're before a judge, it is quite a different story. I have experienced a situation when I represented a client, and in that situation, lawyer, lawyers often challenged my testimony when I wanted to interpret the actual regulatory aspects. As soon as they mentioned the word regulations, they all stood up and, and objected. They say that uh, um, having a good management program to properly manage your confined spaces, they must identify the requirements um, but not the practices. We must aim to be superior to the regulations because they are the minimum threshold. Management must, de must be done on best practices. This is where we're going to get our best uh, bang for our dollar. My experience, Harry, is that uh, a lot of people relying on the letter of the law with regards to regulations can sometimes cause feelings of security. Well, I have to agree oh. with that. Guys, can you maybe give a concrete example of a case where following the regulations was not enough? 
I can certainly suggest uh, using ventilation, for instance, um, incorrectly may actually exhaust explosive dust into the atmosphere, which could be extremely hazardous, obviously. Yeah, indeed. It would really be useful to have uh, some sort of a code of practice to, uh, which is present in many, many regulations. Um, uh, the, for the CSA Z1006, the CSA group has returned to its second version. So the first version was released in 2010. Um, by the way, if you want to have a summary of the main differences, we have a blog on that subject. Yes, thank you, Ari. Um, that blog was uh, released since the last change in 2016 of the new uh, CSA standard, and it gives uh, the highlights of all the changes. So it's very interesting and, and very summarize all the changes. If you need more information, you can find that on the website easily. The CSA uh, standard um, uh, states the practical details which are complementary to the regulation. It is a tool that allows the complete development of the file according to uh, a sound management practices. On page 19 of the standard, there is an interesting flowchart that offers a good summary of the situation. It also defines the requirements and related guidelines for uh, the task management, the actual tasks that are being performed inside the confined space, and coordinating rescues. And it covers also other practical aspects. The standard also aims to protect against the hazards of working in confined space. It aims to better equip the various stakeholders. It can be used as a basis for developing a sound management program. It establishes requirements for commitment, leadership, and participation. The standard also specifies the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholders the details of the training requirements and the skills of the various stakeholders, develops the elements of a rescue operation. And this is often quite a, a thorny issue that is um, difficult for many people to deal with. It specifies requirements also for contractors or subcontractors. It mentions elements relating to the management and the establishment of audits. In summary, this standard serves as a guide for anyone wishing to build or enhance a management program. In a few words, the regulations will tell you what to do, and the standard says how you should do it. The two are complementary. I want to clarify that the regulations take precedence over standards, unless they are specifically mentioned in the regulations. There are certain reg uh, elements of the CSA Z1000-16 standard that cannot be applied at the provincial level, in particular the notion of monitoring detection of gases. Unfortunately, it does not have the force of law because it is not mentioned in provincial re regulations. On the other hand, it can serve as a reference document for certain disputes by the authority because it touches on the practical aspects and its application is, however, uh, voluntary. Um, we have had the chance to train workers' compensation uh, or Ministry of Labor inspectors uh, for uh, for ten year or ten year period, and with the arrival of the standard, the inspectors use it to ensure proper application of their regulations. Thank you, Ari. So it's very important point, and we we went over the regulations and uh, the standard. So before going into the um, key elements and the success, the success of, condition of success, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to invite, invite you again, just not to hesitate to ask us questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions, so at any time um, you, you can use that. But before moving on, um, let's, let's ask you a question again where we would like to know how often do you review your program? So you should have a question to your screen, and you can select in the answer if rarely or only when necessarily, regularly uh, and as a non-frequency, following an incident, just before a corporate OHS audit, and following the inspector vi visit. So people are currently voting. I'll give you a little bit of time before we look at the results. Most of you answer is fast. Okay. We look at the results. So, wow. Okay. So 82% of the people answer that rarely. 
or only when necessarily, and 9% uh, regularly, and 9% just before corporate OHS audit. Are you surprised of, uh, of that answer? I'm not surprised whatsoever. I've seen this frequently, and what happens is that we very, over a space of a few years, we have an outdated uh, program that we have relied on, and uh, the industry has moved forward, and we are becoming more and more behind the times. Okay, so let's now discuss the key elements for managing confined space. Indeed, Valerie, we will discuss here the elements for the next few minutes for an effective management of confined spaces. By specifying the key elements, we will also talk about best practices and the gaps still observed in 2017. Here we can see some key elements on the management of confined spaces. The details will allow you to build, improve, or audit your confined space management program. Harry, before you continue, do you feel that the number of fatal accidents in Canada in the early 2000s started to change things and ideas about the management of confined spaces? Absolutely. I've seen this uh, um, in many of the provinces. Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, an accident in mind. And you could probably clearly identify a time when these changes were becoming much more important, where the regulations are taking a, a much more uh, important role in our situation, where we're wanting to make updates to the reg to our own uh, standards, internal standards. And um, these accidents are often the driving force from back in the year during the 2000s. And what we see now, how, however, is that most of us are wanting to get away from the reactive type of management to the, uh, the um, prevention or the, uh, the, the proactive type of, of management. Um, so when, it, when, concerning, when, when we're looking at these key elements, Concerning the recognition and identifi identification of confined spaces, still today in 2017, this is an element that brings most of the questions. We continuously reevaluate current practices on this question. I believe that 90 to 95 percent of confined spaces are very easily identifiable. The remaining 5 to 10 percent often lead to debate or even divergent views. However, this percentage may increase in some of your sectors or some of your activities. After identifying the confined spaces, it becomes essential to fix signs or placards to avoid any debates afterwards. And is the signage a regulation requirement concerning confined spaces? No, unfortunately it's not. However, the CSA standard suggests it and many corporate standards require it. When I heard about confined space, I asked myself the question, how do you define an entry into a confined space? Is it something that people regularly, regularly ask you? or? Absolutely. It's, it's a very uh, difficult question for many, many people. Um, I love this question. Uh, it's one that I have to deal with uh, many, many times. It should have been even asked as an interactive question in order to have an overview of the participant's understanding. After identifying a confined space, the CSA standard defines a confined space entry as action by which a person enters a confined space. Entrance includes work or rescues to be formed in the confined space and is considered affected as soon as a portion of the entrance body passes through the plane of the opening leading to the interior of the confined space. So if I enter a hand, my foot, my head, it's considered an entry into a confined space. We could even spend the rest of this webinar on that. In your management, it must be clear, precise, and understood by all what constitutes a confined space entry. Second item, the essential elements concerning the confined spaces are the elimination of certain confined spaces. We do sometimes have opportunities to, um, for certain engineering type of exercises to eliminate confined spaces. It's not so much as to ignore hazards, it's just to reduce 
the pressure that companies uh, have to manage um, hazards at various levels. Um, it could also be the management of new confined spaces. I mean, what can we do to reduce the number of entries? What can we do to uh, make access much simpler? How can we modify these to make things uh, easier? For example, to change the position of the openings the characterization of the confined spaces and the hazardous, the hazardous tasks that are performed therein. The management of entry, such as permit issuing. As for gas detection and ventilation, the CA, CSA standard addresses these two aspects pretty well in appendices C and E. Number three, regarding the training of the various stakeholders, it is important to assess your basic needs. The CSA Z1006 standard can certainly help us with that. Effective and appreciated training must be adapted and personalized, practical, dynamic, and put into context, especially uh, of, an appropriate, of an appropriate duration. Some training sessions are maybe too short, some only online. Others focus on legal requirements. Workers need to handle Need, uh, workers are, are preferred to be handling physically the type of equipment and the, uh, the actual entries that we use going into confined space to have a good appreciation of their training. We'll see later in the webinar how MSA can help you with some tools that are online, such as MSA University, the online simulators on gas detectors and some other things. Uh, Sean, you're taking the words right out of my mouth. Okay, as for number four, the roles and the responsibilities. It must be well defined from the senior management and all the way down to the equipment custodian. And number five, in 2017, I believe it is still important to establish a step-by-step -step approach for each confined space or a group of confined spaces. Management will be more efficient. Avoid putting everything in the same pile. Number six, Managing contractors is an important factor to consider. We must prepare them and other visitors. They are often left to themselves and do not always know very well the tasks that are being performed therein. And often in companies that have difficult confined space entries, they often leave this to contractors to deal with it completely on their own. And this would be a hazardous situation. Number seven, confined space rescue is still a taboo subject in the management of confined spaces. It's important to develop and test rescue procedures. What often poses a challenge is who will perform the rescue if needed? Is it an internal or an external team? If it's the city firefighters, are you able to establish a memorandum of understanding? Does your uh, municipality or your uh, local fire departments actually perform confined space rescues. CSA Z1006 can help you with these aspects in appendices B2 and D. According to the CSA, there are four different types of rescue. Um, there are non-entry rescue, and these are the ones usually reserved for the people working on site. The, um, the attendant can perform this. If you have to uh, rely on an entry rescue, it must be done by a trained team. The attendant can then, at this point, become a, an important resource person. Number eight, another ailment, which in my opinion, requires a lot of improvement in the effective management of confined space, conf confined spaces concerns, work and rescue equipment. There is still work to be done uh, regarding the, the choice, the storage, the inspection, recertification, and these must be included with other aspects mentioned above. Um, uh, Harry, if I can jump in here. Um, sure. I think managing the equipment can be very challenging, especially when you have a lot of equipment and a lot of workers. Um, the maintenance, the inspection, recertification, having the date. Um, I want to let you know that there are solutions and services available to you, a uh, system to help you track that information and be sure to always uh, comply and have the equipment that is ready to go inspect and recertify. Uh, recertify. 
I absolutely. Thank you, Valerie. Um, and finally, very important to me, is the performance evaluation of the management of our program. Audits are essential. They can recognize good moves and identify adjustments to your program to improve performance. It's very, very important. It must be proactive and not reactive. It should not be seen as a threat, but more as an opportunity. So here's some interesting questions, Harry. Is it the kind of questions that you, you got from clients during training or during consulting? Yeah, these are very common questions. It's often the questions that customers ask us. What applies? elsewhere does not necessarily apply in your organization. We must take into account the specificities. So where do we start? What are the implement implementation steps? We will make available a document concerning the three main steps to creating a successful management program. What are the efforts that are required? What are the necessary resources in terms of financial and human resources? What are the impacts on the organization and our oper operations? The operational organizations could be positive, negative, or they could be neutral. What are the conditions for a successful confined space project? This we'll see a little further in the presentation. There are various documents associ associated with management. Here is a suggested list program or procedure, such as the, uh, the paper management uh, document, a list of confined spaces, the inventory that you have of your confined spaces, and also including on-site signage, the risk analysis sheet, sometimes called a confined space data sheet, concerning the confined spaces, specific to each confined space or specific to each group or type of confined space, and also a data sheet concerning the tasks to be performed inside the, the confined space. And then there's the entry permit, which could be generic or specific, or specific, which is generally the control document to be used for entering confined spaces. The rescue procedure, such as the rescue plans or rescue scenarios, Procedure for entering the confined space, which could be general uh, or specific. The list of tasks and rescue equipment. The log books concerning equipment and gas detection inspections. And also a log book, log book uh, uh, listing the personnel that are trained. And also what is the training content that you require in your training uh, programs. The training content, I would have to add, should be practical, practical, practical. There are three winning components to a successful uh, management program. First one we can see here is operational. Often it's the most advanced. All actions of a technical and, and practical nature such as the list of the confined spaces, the hazard analysis, the purchase and use of equipment, and I would also add the um, recertification uh, plans for all this equipment. The confined space signage, uh, the, how do we train the stakeholders? What is the training required for each one? What is the content of the training that we, we, we require? Development of an entry program, including rescue procedures and the follow-ups. We must follow up rigorously on this program. Organizational, all actions in terms of strategic and human management to ensure the implementation and mobilizing integration in the daily operational measures, measures, measures such as priority level for management, real internal me uh, leadership, mobilizing leaders such as the champions, availability of resources, communication, inform information and awareness, and communication, which is a key element, and the involvement of your various uh, people. The values is the set of beliefs and convictions that guide the senior management and the managers in the implement implementation of the program. 
prevention is an investment. The human dimension makes the difference. Conviction begins at the top. Accountability is created. Got a good example of um, some work we did in a, con in a, uh, in a, in a nearby city uh, with the confined space management program. And we found that they were actually pretty good when it came to senior management involvement, putting the tools into place, the equipment into place, the procedures into place, the documents that required. But when we get down to the uh, employee level, we found that there was no real buy-in by the employees and the supervisors. They figured, since they had always done it this way, the same way, and never had a problem, so why change? We have seen many years ago that NIOSH actually uh, produced a, um, a uh, survey that found that this was the situation in 80% of the fatal accidents in confined spaces. So 80% of the time, they've done this always the same way, and for some reason something changed, and now we had a fatal situation. It has to be simple and think of planned versus unplanned, such as an emergency situation. And talking about emergency situations, we're talking about uh, unplanned um, uh, confined space entries. The managers must be the driver. We saw the opposite in the previous page with the example of the city. By the way, beware if you do not hear anything. This is not a good sign. So if, this, if you hear nothing, go quickly and observe the actual practice in the field. You may be surprised. Just to add, Harry, this is an ongoing task and we always have to be vigilant, vigilant about updating these uh, and uh, this whole project continually adding to it. We want to share with you some of the things that we observed when we performed audits at the various companies. There is, in many cases, a let go, a fruit of habits when the entries are made or by regular speakers of the organization, confined spaces where entrances are frequent. They always do the same job regularly. So they've always done it this way and they never had any problems. The rescue plans were not tested. So we have a rescue plan developed, but we're not even sure if it actually works. The document information has not been updated since, uh, despite changes or errors. We have passed many, many years and still no changes in our documentation. New workers have not been trained or informed. Poorly completed documents, such as the, uh, the permit or the, uh, the hazard analysis document, the data sheets, or staff who are no longer trained or not up to date or have come to the company and they have said, I've already been trained somewhere else. When it comes to uh, different sectors, the practices are sometimes different according to these sectors. The mechanics of management surrounding the work of subcontractors is not planned or known. They are often left to themselves. Like I said earlier, uh, Often we solve these problems by handing it off to contractors and just leave them alone. Uh, so this can be a hazardous situation, as I said earlier. The procedures and plans are not established in the case of an emergency. So sometimes we have something written, sometimes we don't have something written, but we have nothing in, in, in any kind of concise form that let us know that the, uh, the rescue plan is actually a viable one. The training is minimal and or has no practical part to it. So it's all theoretical. And Harry, is there really a difference um, when, when it comes to the job when people don't have the practical side of the training? Oh yeah, I see a huge difference. I find a lot of appreciation when it comes to our training sessions because people have, have seen, touched, experienced, observed the approach of an entry. And this practical aspect, the actual doing it, is not to be neglected. The different documents that may be useful for you, like I mentioned earlier, the CSA Z1006-16. There's also a, another document that came out recently, the NFPA and the American uh, document, the NFPA 350. 
And we have blogs about confined spaces on the SPI website, which can help be very helpful for you. There are also different documents, such as the typical management program, which we have available, and different uh, types of forms, such as the data sheets, the uh, audits, the, uh, the permits, um, the, the various documentation on, that we use on site for managing confined spaces. Thank you, Ari. So I will now leave the floor to Sean. And Sean, could you please uh, tell us a little bit how MSA can help in the management of confined spaces? Thanks, Valerie. MSA has a complete range of confined space products uh, from fall protection equipment, entrance, entry equipment, uh, hard hats obviously, gas detection and airline and self-contained breathing apparatus. So we really have a full suite of products that really covers almost everything you need to enter uh, and exit safely from a confined space as well as rescue uh, equipment as well. We also provide some online tools and guidance to simplify the selection process and the training of confined space personal protective equipment based on industry and work application. MSA has a dedicated web page for confined spaces which you can find under the applications tab on our home page. This website uh, is dedicated to this um, application and covers some various aspects including some legislative aspects as well as the potential hazards you may encounter, the hierarchy of controls and links to various pieces of prote personal protective equipment that you might need when entering a confined space. Some other tools that MSA has is the respiratory response guide which will help you to determine what type of respirator you might need once you've determined what atmosphere you're dealing with. Uh, and then a pocket guide to airline systems which will help you assemble an air, a complete airline system should your confined space uh, require it. And it will certainly walk you through all the steps needed. We also have the online simulators for all our gas detection products. And these simulators really allow you to handle in virtual reality basically the product so you can have the alarms going off, it will have all these set points available, you can walk through the, the setup, the um, changes of the product, you can test it, try it, play around with it without having fear of the alarms going off in your office and making a noise and not knowing how to turn it off. It's a really, really simple way of uh, showing people and demonstrating people how the, the products work and use and are used without actually having to touch it physically and, and have fear of the product. The final part of uh, our tools is the, the MSAU, the online training. MSA University allows you to set up um, an administrator for an account which uh, will allow you to have participants go in to the, their account, uh, take selected uh, exams or courses that you've prescribed and then watch videos, do a course, do a test, receive 80% for the test and then receive a certificate for that. And this, this allows a lot of for customization within this program that you could actually set up various uh, specific courses for people that you require them to take. It also has a complete confined space uh, technology applications and standards uh, course on it as well. Very, very useful thing. You'll find that once again on the, the MSA website, the links to it. Yeah, that's great, Sean. In fact, I really, really enjoy using that uh, simulator. I mean, we've used that uh, on several occasions with some of our clients. And uh, most recently, we had a client that was way up in the mines in northern Quebec. And uh, he called on a Friday night uh, in, in a disastrous state. And he had to prepare for weekend confined space entries and he was stuck having to calibrate his detectors and couldn't figure out how to get it done. And so by being online with him, we guided him through using the simulator and we were able to get him to calibrate his detectors quite easily and within minutes he had accomplished this task. Good. So to conclude, for a program to be effective and realistic, it must be simple and respond to the different levels of an organization. It should not be developed by a single person, but rather the result of a team effort. You must have 
passionate champions in the field. I know there are some online right now. It must be tested and updated regularly, so the audits that are absolutely essential, and it must clearly show the roles and the responsibilities of the stakeholders, such as the managers, and must, the managers must be the drivers in the organization. They must lead by example. To conclude, have your manage, management practice, practices evaluated. Do not hesitate to ask for help. There is always a solution to a problem or a challenge, and we are certainly here to guide you on your journey. Thank you, Ari. So we're now opening the floor uh, for questions. Um, if you have any questions, now is the best time to go through and let us know. Um, I'm gonna go right now to one question here. Um, someone is asking at what uh, height a hole is considered a confined space? That's a very good question. It's one that's troubled many of our, uh, our uh, clients. Um, when you look at the regulations, you won't find anywhere in the regulations uh, in any of the provinces as to at what depth the confined space, the, the, uh, the space becomes a confined space. And so what we often refer to is the, um, the American standard, which says that we should uh, start using uh, anchor points once we get beyond five feet. So uh, inspectors will often use this five feet rule when they are evaluating whether the depth of confined space is sufficient for it to be called a confined space. But basically it's up to the organizations to establish at what depth this becomes a confined space. What we see is many of our clients do use the five foot rule, but quite a few of them, in fact, a majority of them would prefer to use uh, a four foot depth as to establish uh, that it becomes a confined space. And this is certainly uh, provided that it is open on the top, the entire top of the confined space and you cannot crawl underneath a certain structure like a, like a pipeline or a, or a ventilation duct. Once you have something over your head, this provisor, uh, proviso uh, goes out, you know, so you have to, have a, it's got to be a, some sort of a pit with a, a top access and once you get beyond the four feet, well, most, most of our clients now will consider it a confined space. That's interesting. I think it, it shows uh, how you um, discuss the fact that uh, it is challenging for most of the company to be able to recognize uh, what is exactly a, a confined space. Sean, someone is asking, how do we get access uh, to the simulator you just presented a couple of minutes ago? The simulators are available to anybody. You don't have to subscribe or anything. You simply go onto the MSA website, look under resources, and you should see gas tech and simulators. Or if you go onto our website, you'll just go onto the uh, gas detector and questions uh, site itself, the actual page, and there should be a link on there for the simulators as well. So, Okay, it should be pretty easy. Easy, easy to get to. should be. Okay. Let me know if it isn't. So we'll go with one last question before we conclude. Um, can the attendee be part of the rescue team? Yes, and in fact, this is a, a, a two-pronged question. I, 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 I would I would say is that the the attendant um, can perform and should be trained to perform a non-entry rescue. So this is actually um, a, a complex uh, question when it comes to rescue because you should try to establish confined space entries with the option of having a non-entry rescue option. Once you disconnect from the lifeline, then you are stuck with an entry rescue and then the attendant, his only role will become one of, a, uh, of a, uh, an advisor or a, a resource person for the rescue team. The people entering the confined space will have to be um, uh, trained rescuers. Now, this is still quite a, um, a difficult situation for many to, uh, to establish. And if you have uh, much more uh, uh, detailed questions or concerns uh, as to your situation, I would certainly appreciate uh, receiving emails and I would definitely answer your emails on this situation. It's a complex situation. Okay, thank you. We just received another question, so I, I, will, uh, I will take it before we conclude. And this is also about the rescue. 
uh, we're a school board and don't have the personnel or the equipment for a rescue team. Meanwhile, the regulation tells us 911 is not an option. You mentioned uh, some fire departments have do sign off. How often does that happen? It's surprising how few fire departments are not trained in confined space rescue. In order for a municipality to have that capability, the town has to assign that role to them. They have to be equipped for it, and they have to respect NFPA standards. So many municipalities do not have these sort of um, teams in place. But the solution is that there are quite a number of private organizations across the country that have uh, this kind of expertise, and they can be um, um, used as a standby rescue team, especially where we have uh, people going in and they are disconnecting from the lifelines, and we need to, we are required to have an adequate rescue plan. We can certainly help you guide you on, on this uh, situation as well. The, it's something that I've done many times. I'm actually part of a standby rescue team here with SCI, and uh, so this is something that can be uh, can be developed uh, depending on your situation. Okay, thank you, Ari. I hope that answered the question. And, and again, if it's not the case, just feel free to communicate with us and we'll be more than happy um, to help. So thank you very much, Sean, for joining us today for this webinar. Welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry, uh, also for this very interesting presentation. My pleasure. Um, we invite you to insert the very quick survey that's going to pop up uh, to your window that's going to help us improve our next um, webinar. So please uh, take the time to look at that survey and let us know what you, what you like and what you would like to hear in the, uh, the next uh, webinar. If you need more information or if unfortunately we don't have the time to answer your questions, just please feel free to contact me directly and we'll be happy to help. Thank you very much and I wish you all a good afternoon.